ladies and gents, a new upgrade session is about to begin. Download the best version of yourself now. And welcome to stage, Mr. Gerd Leonhardt. Thank Enjoy, you. sir. Have Thank a wonderful you. one. So, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. I will talk to you about technology and humanity. You know, I've been a futurist for uh, 15 years. And it's interesting, the last few years I've noticed around the world when I talk to people about the future, a lot of people are worried about the future. Right? I don't know about you, but I get this constant feedback, you know, there's Donald Trump, there's a Brex the Brexit, technology will take our jobs, robots will kill us. I think it's really good to notice that, uh, you know, technology is uh, improving vastly, but I always think that, you know, the, the future is better than we think. Now, we have this constant debate about what the future is and which way we can go. And I'm really an optimist in the future. I'll tell you why in a second. But here's an important point, right? Technology is not the purpose of life. Technology is a tool. And technology can be magic. And there's so many magic things about technology. You know, when you listen to Steve Jobs introduce all the great stuff, his second word was magic all the time. Right? But technology can also be toxic. You know, poisoning. The best example is Facebook. So one day, you know, we look at Facebook as being a magic tool to connect and to market, and well, it's fantastic, right? The next day, we found out that it was used to manipulate elections. And, and the funny part is that, you know, I, I left Facebook four weeks ago as, as a result of that discussion. The funny part is that Facebook was not doing anything criminal. You know, Mark Zuckerberg obviously isn't an idiot. I mean, he's not a criminal. They weren't hacked. Right? It wasn't an accident. The system was used as it was designed. Right? That's what scares me the most. Right? So you use technology as it was supposed to be designed, and it has really negative effect. So we have to think about a balance of technology and humanity, the two things that we we use the most. Um, I made a movie a couple of weeks ago called uh, "Let's." We need to talk about AI, art about artificial intelligence. So take a look on YouTube. Uh, the the URL is we need to talk about AI.com. It's a five-minute video, and you can watch it. And of course, my book "Technology versus Humanity." Uh, we do have it available later for the VIP session, which I think is at 10:30 in the other room. So if you're lucky to be there, you'll you get a free book. Otherwise, uh, you know where to find it. So I want to start with a short quote from a, a, uh, an, one of my mentors in futurism, Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke uh, was a really famous guy who wrote about the future, was a science fiction writer, and here's what he says about the future, 1967. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. So, if what I say now seems to you to be very reasonable, then I'll fail completely. Only if what I tell you appears absolutely unbelievable have we any chance of visualizing the future as it really will happen. Well, that's a good start, right? So let's be unreasonable. Think about the future and think about possibilities. I think it's imagination and courage are the key for the future. You know, Einstein once said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Uh, if you want a job in the future, knowledge is great and skills are great, but imagination is the winning party. And you can see that already, what's going on around us. You know, I, as I said earlier, I think the future will be awesome considering technology, but there's just a tiny thing. We have to make sure that we keep our priorities straight. Right? What is technology supposed to do? And I'd like uh, to ask companies I work with, you know, are you on team human or are you on team robot? Do you prefer technology over relationships? And there's so many things that we're seeing today, hundreds of examples of apps and uses of media where it kind of feels like it's built for itself. You know, not so much for us, but for itself. Uh, there's a great app you should check out if you have a second called Replica. Right? Replica replicates you. You teach the app who you are. Right? You feed it all information about messages and email and whatever, right? And the purpose of the app is to speak on your behalf when you die. Okay? So that the survivors can speak to the app as if it was you. Right? Uh, that's a, a, a really amazing use. I think that's more like a team robot than anything else. But 
you know, we see in this future clearly, this is the number one topic, right? Man and machine are, I wouldn't say converging, but we have a symbiosis, right? I mean, interesting to see that this device here is already your external brain, right? It's something that we keep all the information in here, we keep the music in here, the media, the banking, the dating, right? This is our second brain. This machine here has a million times the computing power of the machine that brought people to the moon. And in 10 years, it will be a million times further. And what do we do then? I mean, in this symbiosis, which way do we go? Because, you know, we're clearly heading in a world that looks like this, the evolution of mankind. From the mobile phone to wearables, augmented reality, virtual reality, the brain-computer interface. As I like to say, the world's going to change more in 20 years than the previous 300 years. And many people think, okay, that's a crazy thing to say, you know, considering the industrial society and the steam engine and all these things, right? But all the things we're going to see in the next 20 years, machines that we can speak to, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, cognitive machines. Let me ask you a question, how far would you want to take this? Do you want to be in the world where you constantly are connected to the network using a brain-computer interface? Do you want to be superhuman? Well, the simple answer is, of course, everybody wants to be superhuman. Right? But is it a good idea? I think we should think about this a little bit. Here's a reminder of this. You know, I think the more power we get, the more responsibility we get. Again, Facebook makes a great example. Facebook is the biggest country in the world, 2.2 billion users. Mark Zuckerberg is the true president of the world. Right? And they have huge responsibility, but you know what they say, we're not a medium and we're not responsible. I don't think that has a future, because <laughs> you know, that is just a little bit too far of an excuse. But let's go back in time a little bit. One of my favorite films, and you know, we are in a movie theater, right? So I will use the example. Right? This is really what got me to be thinking about the futurist, being a futurist, uh, was the original Blade Runner. And there's a fantastic scene in Blade Runner, I'll play for you now, uh, that shows kind of what the topic is all about. She's a replicant, isn't she? I'm impressed. How many questions does it usually take to spot one? I don't get it, Tyrell. How many questions? 20, 30, cross-referenced. It took more than 100 for Rachel, didn't it? She doesn't know. She's beginning to suspect, I think. Suspect? How can it not know what it is? Commerce is our goal here at Tyrell. More human than human is our motto. That's the key word, right? Commerce is our motto. More human than human is our goal. That sounds a whole lot like what we're thinking about today, right? especially in advertising and marketing. Is that a good idea? I mean, at a certain point, you could say commerce as a goal is, you know, we all have commerce as a goal, right? But how far do we go with this? I mean, what we have today built in advertising and marketing is largely tracking and surveillance. Right? That, that's how marketing and advertising works. That needs to change. And I think it's changing now with content marketing and all different kinds of engagement. But clearly, this is a future where we have to think about this. You know, ultimately, this is the question. When I think about my own future, you know, do I want to be smarter? Then I would, in essence, connect to the network, the cloud. I think I would prefer to be more human. So I, I would fear that becoming superhuman would make me become a machine. And sometimes, you know, we can see that when we, when we get connected too much, we kind of feel like, you know, we have this constant debate about how we can upgrade ourselves, right? I mean, the most ridiculous concept is transcending humanity. This is what we hear from other futurists a lot. We need to transcend our humanity. I mean, it's funny, because many of us haven't even discovered their humanity. They haven't even used what they have. But instead, of course, you know, we can transcend it and become superhuman. I mean, think about this for a second, right? The mobile phone and the internet is a religion. And I'm a big, you know, I, I use it a lot. <laughs> I can't say that I'm free of this, not at all, right? But how sustainable is this? 
How sustainable is this, you know, having artificial intelligence telling us what to do? It's okay if we do it for Google Maps, you may do it for Tinder if you feel like it, you may do it for LinkedIn or for Twitter, right? But imagine you do this for medical care, right? you do it for lawmaking, for judges, for traffic. You know, the completely automated traffic that's currently being looked at in terms of autonomous driving, you know, you wouldn't even stop at the intersection because the computer would lead all the cars to go straight through. Like, you know, talk about traffic jam in Bucharest this morning with autonomous cars, it will be like completely orchestrated, right? But the consequence is you don't drive yourself. You can't. Okay. You could not, in a system where everybody's driving uh, by computer, there's no way you could drive because right? it wouldn't connect. The other thing is, you know, we're looking at a world to where everything is being brought to us. You heard about the singularity, maybe? I call this a sofa-larity, you know? So we're sitting back and, you know, everything is coming to us. I mean, I, I feel it's going to make us pretty lazy. Right? And it's gonna, we're going to be in a world to where we are enjoying the tremendous uh, pleasures of virtual reality, right? Uh, and completely falling off, off, the, off the wagon when it doesn't exist. I mean, how boring would the world be if we've been in virtual reality? Right? I mean, if you spend a couple hours in there. And, you know, is that sustainable as a business model, like the, the addiction model that we see on social media? Right? I think it's not a bad thing per se, but, you know, when we do it too much, it becomes kind of an obvious thing to where... I mean, this is what's happening here, right? I mean, make no mistake about this. These companies are making digital copies of you. Literally. And the purpose of the digital copy is two things. One is to sell you stuff, which is not a bad thing. It's just you know, maybe sometimes a bit overdone. A uh, second one, to influence you. And a third one is to track you. So up to a certain point, that's all okay. It's a good deal, right? But when it gets a little bit too far out, you know, we end up here right? to where... <laughs> You know, this is all that matters. You know, our kids are already starting to think of the digital world rather than the real world. I often wonder when I'm on the airplane watching a three-year-old kid playing with the iPad, you know, because the kids are quiet when they play with the iPad, right? But the kid plays with the iPad for two hours. I do wonder what happens when the three-year-old goes to the beach. Right? The beach is boring. Right? That's, I'm not sure that's a good thing because, you know, the iPad could be so much more entertaining. So that's the question, how far is that sustainable? Where do we go with this? And, and you know, this is going to be on an exponential scale. I mean, uh, if you think this is crazy today, just give it five years. You know, we're going on this exponential scale basically means the power of technology will be one times 1,000 in 10 years. You know, quantum computing, which is the next level of computing, is just being invented. Our responsibility is to draw the line between efficiency and freedom, security and privacy, super intelligence and happiness. So yeah, see, I love to quote myself, but this is for my latest movie. <laughs> but you know, this is an important question. Efficiency is great, but you know, if if efficiency makes us behave like robots, that's not good. Security is great, but you know, what about privacy? I mean, if you want all security, no privacy, you can. Uh, you know, sign up for the Silicon Valley agenda. You know, I think this is really important that we keep up reminding ourselves really what the story is. You know, basically, technology is not what we seek, but how we seek. It's a tool. When a carpenter uses a hammer to build a house, he's not proudly looking at the hammer and saying, oh, what an amazing hammer. Right. Well, he may do that eventually, but you know, he's looking at the house. He's saying, like, I've built a house. That's what I do. Right? The hammer is a tool. And you know, if you're looking at what happens with people, basically what matters for us, you know, to achieve happiness, basically, uh, positive uh, psychology says those five things, what's called PERMA, right? Positivity, engagement, relationships, meaning, accomplishment. And if you're in marketing, this is what you need to do to connect with people, right? Meaning, purpose, context, not noise, pressure, Mousetraps. If you use technology to build a better mousetrap to capture customers, it will usually come out pretty badly. It works for a while uh, because they may be stupid enough to actually follow this. I mean, the best example are airlines, right? Airlines use technology to build better mousetraps and charge us more money. 
while Amazon is using technology to give us something. This is why Amazon is so powerful and so important. Right? The, the biggest lesson here to learn for us is that machines don't do relationships. You can fall in love with your whatever virtually on the screen, then you end up in a movie like her, right? And you can be happy using WhatsApp and, you know, technology can make us happy to some degree, right? But, you know, you buy a new iPhone, you're happy for what? Two hours, a day, two days, a week? You spent the same money to go hiking with your kids, you're happy for the rest of your life, thinking back. Right? Machines don't do relationships. That's, we shouldn't use them for this. Machines do numbers, and that can support the relationships. I think this is a key message when you think about marketing, advertising, you know, how we build our brands in the future. The relationship is something that you have to build. I mean, trust is not a download, right? So you can say, wow, trust my company, click here. Right? And it's, what a ridiculous idea. And you know, you don't get married to your husband or your wife because she is efficient, right? It's a little bit more than that. Right? So we have to think about which way we're going with this and what exactly that means for us, because here's the bottom line, right? Technology is not really about ethics. Right? Technology has no ethics, no values. It's neutral. It's not good or bad. Any technology can be used for amazing things and for really bad things. People are addicted to television, just like they're addicted to social media. We use nuclear power to make bombs or to make power plants, which is probably equally bad, but you know, different discussion. How do we make sure technology is used in a human way? And right now, we can safely say technology is pretty lame to a large degree, like artificial intelligence is not really intelligent, and the, the, uh, the uh, assistant like Siri, Cortana, Alexa is kind of working, but nah, you know, not like a person. Yeah. But very soon it will. I mean, make no mistakes about this. In the next 10 years, the, the amount of technology that be like science fiction is going to explode. We're going to talk to computers, just like we talk to people. I think it can be very confusing. We have to think about what that means for us. What is ethics? When Mark Zuckerberg, I'd love to talk about Mark. He makes an ideal story right now. You know, the interesting thing about when he spoke at Congress and the European Commission is not what he said. It's the stupid questions from the people who ask him. Not a single really interesting question. I think all of us could have probably asked more interesting questions. Here's the definition of ethics. It's known the difference between what you have a right and the power to do and what is the right thing to do. Now, let's, you know, I'm not talking about ethics like, you know, in the California ephemeral kind of way, right? I mean, we can debate, you know, this is not like, like green energy or renewable or sustainable energy, which is to many people still optional, not for me, but for many it is. It's not optional to be human, at least not for me. I mean, there isn't a single person in the world that doesn't want to be human, except for maybe some people want to be a machine, <laughs> you know, cyborgs, but that's very few. How do we stay human in this world? How do we figure out how we do this? And then now all of a sudden Marx talks about privacy and, you know, I took the opportunity to leave Facebook because I find it unethical. Not because they made a, committed a crime or something, you know, they, I, I find it unethical. And I think this is a discussion that we need to have, which way we're going with this. I mean, if you look in that direction, you can go to China. You know, China is building an app, Open Sesame. Every single Chinese citizen will be rated on a scale from 1 to 700 on their credit worthiness. Okay. The government is running this. And this app, basically, if you have a number that's generated through social media and credit reports, and, and if, you, if your number isn't high enough, you won't get a loan or a marriage license, right? or you can't leave the country. I mean, this is truly you know, Black Mirror, right? <laughs> George Orwell, you know, do we want to go that far? Do we want to go here? This is a, a screenshot of what happens in China already. Face recognition at almost every major intersection. I mean, this is true face recognition with people, with everything. And interestingly enough, you know, Google is, has a lot of AI, and Google just decided a couple of days ago to not do a project with the Defense Department. Right? After a lot of debate, 
exactly for this reason, of ethical reasons. So in this world, you know, we're, we're clearly seeing where this is going, right? Data is the new oil. I've said this for 15 years, but the companies that have data, that use data, are the most powerful companies in the world. In good and in bad ways, but you know, they, they have more power than oil and gas combined or nuclear. And the next step, you know, Andy G from Baidu keeps saying this, AI, artificial intelligence, is the new electricity. You take those two together, you can, you can imagine what happens here, right? Everything is being touched by this. Whether it's retail or commerce or telecom or media, and the next thing is the Internet of Things. Connecting everything, pipelines, logistics, products, services, everything. You take those, two, three, uh, those three things together, that gives you a map for the future. And there's billions being invested in this. And here's a key question, really. And this is a 16 trillion dollar uh, euro temptation. That's what McKinsey says is happening here with the revenues. Uh, 62 trillion dollar per year annual revenue change when this is going. So the question is when we build this kind of algorithmic society, right, that's based on data, information, connectivity, I think it's fantastic. We can save energy, we can solve problems, we can build smart cities. It's great, right? But imagine what happens when this actually works. Who protects our information? Who makes sure the right people are seeing the right thing? Right now, there's absolutely no guarantee for that. So, you know, this is a question. It's doable. It's profitable, but is it desirable to have a global brain? You know? uh, in fact, Google has a project called the Global Brain. Right? Well, I think every tech company has a brain project right? <laughs> to build the brain of information. If you're in marketing, this is fantastic. The more brain, the better. Right? You can reach people, you can segmentize, you can do all these things. And here's where the power is in our society today. Kleiner Perkins' latest slideshow, 2018 Internet Stats. Right? Top 20 companies, who are they? Not oil, gas, banking, right? definitely not a Romanian company, or even a European company, right? They are Chinese and American, mostly American, actually. And there's companies that you haven't even heard of, and they have tripled their market power in trillions. This is trillions, by the way, not millions, right? Uh, so they, we're talking about six trillion here, right? They tripled their market power. The top four companies have more money than the entire state of France. GDP of France. So they could buy France if they wanted to have more trouble, they could buy France. No, I'm just kidding, more fun, of course, not trouble, what I'm saying. But clearly what happens here, you know, we're moving into the cloud. Our healthcare records, our money, digital money, blockchain, smart cities, this is what's happening everywhere. Everything is moving into the cloud. If you use Spotify, that's in the cloud, Netflix in the cloud, films in the cloud. It's efficient, it works, you know, it's inevitable. But the more we move into the cloud, the more we connect, the more it matters who is in control. You know, right now somebody could look at your Netflix prof profile or even Spotify and decide if you're uh, straight or not and what your preferences would be. That's possible. Well, those are, those are minor things, but when everything is in the cloud, your healthcare records, you know, how do we know that the insurance doesn't peek in on your life? And we'll find out that you're smoking or, you know, doing other really bad things. So this is the important thing. How do we put this inside, right? How do we make sure that we can still make a mistake? Should we be allowed to make mistakes? Absolutely. Right? Should we be allowed to have mystery, privacy, secrets, lies? Right? Can you imagine a human life without lies? Mistakes, serendipity, accidents, discovery. I mean, that would be utterly boring. Right? I mean, we are actually the opposite of machines. We do all those things that machines don't, you know, that they would have no idea what to do about it. Right? So this is very important. We put our human back inside. And this is also important about artificial intelligence. Right? I mean, these days, you know, every day there's a press release for some, you know, really old fashioned company like, you know, whatever housing project in Moscow saying XYZ is now using AI, right? Give me a break. I mean, you're using software that is more intelligent than before. That's pretty much it, right? I mean, let's not use it as a mousetrap. Let's use it as a, as a, a way of, f of funding new things, right? I mean, this is really important that we realize that, 
You know, technology is exponential, but humans are not. I mean, this is what technology does. And we are at the takeoff point of technology. I mean, you're lucky because before this curve, it didn't really do anything. No, no paperless office, no cloud, no autonomous driving, no solar energy. It's all happening now. I mean, you're lucky because now you get to be part of this ramp. In the next seven years, we're going to roughly go to 256. That's 50x of what we are today. The kids of your kids will never know how to drive a car. They won't know what a book li looks like. That's kind of sad. They write books, right? Maybe they just look at it from the outside, right? But the bottom line is this. This is our biggest challenge, right? This is what technology does, and this is what we do. We are lame and slow and make mistakes, and we're not going to be exponential unless you become a machine. And that's a good thing. So once we get to this point, we can use the power of the machines to improve what we want to do without giving too much authority to them. That's the key word. If an artificial intelligence or an AI, or what I call IA, intelligent assistance, if they figure out how to book me an airline ticket for better, that's fantastic, right? But I don't want them to tell me if I can have kids or not based on my DNA, right? I mean, there's, there's a difference in magnitude. <laughs> if we use it for advertising or marketing, you know, uh, programmatic advertising or whatever, that's all good as long as we don't act like the Stasi, right? And peek in on people's lives at all times. Like, you know, the Amazon Echo, the Alexa, right? We jokingly in Germany, we, we call this the Stasi in the box. Right? You know what the Stasi is, the security service of the East German government, right? Because it listens to you. Does it listen the whole time? Well, allegedly not, but obviously it could. Right? So we have to think about where this is going because this is hell then, right? It's hell and heaven at the same time. Technology is amazing and it could also be terrible depending on how we use it. Now, this is our responsibility not to use it, of course, like I quit Facebook, but in the end, who is going to make sure that technology and science and business is not overwhelming what we want as people? Who is going to make sure? Well, that's the role of government, right? Allegedly. If it was a good government, if they knew what they were doing. And they're going to have to. Because right? there are three big things happening, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, geoengineering, and the fourth one is actually uh, uh, human genome editing, right? changing our genes. We need the government to step up to this. The government has to make sure it's mostly heaven and as little hell as possible. Because, you know, what can we do? I mean, we can quit Facebook, we can quit LinkedIn, you can stop using a smartphone, yes, you can do all those things. But in all reality, can we? Right? Can we disconnect? So I often say that in my speeches that we need an ethics council. You know, we need organizations that say, you know, what is important to us is that we have human flourishing. And with ethics, I don't mean religion, I don't mean morals, I mean just really basic stuff. Like, we shouldn't use machines to kill people automatically without human supervision. Automated drones, right? That is a huge discussion right now. Should we use machi machines to change our genes so that we can program ourselves? Well, we should use them to fight cancer. Right? Should we use them to program our babies, make sure they're smarter, bigger, you know, live longer? Right? So huge debates that we should talk about. This is the key issue, no matter what business you're in, right? You have to define a balance between technology and humanity. Do not treat your customers like an algorithm. Do not treat them like a wheel, like an like efficiency engine. I mean, it's very tempting, you know, because technology allows us to do this. You know? Do not think of the world like this, you know, this global brain that allows us to do all these things so we don't have to do anything anymore. We can just sit back and take the money. Very important to remember, you know, technology is a great servant, but a terrible master. I mean, addiction to what we do on the internet is a big topic, not maybe for us so much, but for example, in Korea, there's like 30 clinics just for addiction to the internet. So as a mind-boggling story, I think ultimately, uh, you know, intelligent machines will change our world more than any invention in human history. And we cannot go back and say, let's not have them, right? Because, yeah, I mean, that's not going to happen, right? 
But let's think about this for a second. I mean, these machines may be intelligent in the technical sense, really, but what they really are is, you know, uh, primarily based on machine learning. Machine learning, simply put, is the art of a machine reading huge amount of information, like 100 billion data feeds, and then deriving patterns and coming up with something new. So these are machines that program themselves, so to speak, like, you know, the Go game and chess and many others. When you have machines that can learn, what do we do? Isn't that what we do? Well, we're not machines, right? But we're learning from facts. Right? So our job is going to change. In roughly five to seven, eight, maybe ten years, your job is no, not going to be about knowledge anymore. It's going to be about understanding. There's two different things here. Because the machines will have knowledge. They will do bookkeeping, they will do financial advice, they will run ads. Right? They, they're already doing that, right? but they'll finally be good at it. So very important for us, uh, the difference between those things. Right? Human intelligence is very complex. And you know, many researchers say we have eight or ten different kinds of intelligence. Right? We have kinesthetic, you know, we, we have a body, most of us have a body. Social, emotional, kinesthetic. Right? And what intelligence does, do machines have? Machines have any intelligence, they have one intelligence, and that is intellectual, so to speak, right? Computing. And with that, they will limitlessly beat us. So a machine could have, theoretically speaking, an IQ of a trillion, eventually. Right? But would it have any of these? Should, it, should we allow them to have any of these? I don't think so. I think that's actually two entirely different things. And really what that means for work is the end of routine. Machines will, in the next 10 years, learn any routine, whether it's driving a car, flying an airplane, doing your bookkeeping, you know, intelligent assistance, booking your, your hairdressing appointments, whatever, right? As, as long as it's just routine. But think about this for a second. In our lives, you know, we are actually much beyond routine. All of us have to do routine. If we can get rid of the routine, why not? As long as it's not meaningful routine, you know? Like, if you're a musician, I used to be a musician and producer, it takes an average 10,000 hours to master the instrument. Unless you're uh, Jimi Hendrix, you know, who, who mastered it after two hours, right? But it takes 10,000 hours. It, the machine can't help us with this, right? This is the process of what we do. You can't get the machine to reduce it to three hours. Then you're just going to play on an iPad app. Yeah, you can do that, but is that the same thing? I mean, the end of routine is coming, and that's going to change our work, our economic system, our education. And I don't think the end of routine will make us useless. You know, there's many people saying that when machines are coming, that we can give up those jobs, will become useless, like, like a horse, right? the horse of the digital age. I don't think we're going to be useless. I think we have to give ourselves more credit than this. We have 10 years to figure this out because the bottom line is that this is what we do. Right? We don't do what machines do. Uh, in fact, machines would not understand any of this. Imagination? Can you imagine you would ask a machine to imagine something? Yeah, they can, they can predict something based on patterns and data, but that's not the same than imagination. They can write music, they can write articles, but they're fact-driven. Right? So ethics, empathy, compassion, consciousness, will, have, will machines eventually learn that? Could be, maybe 50 years, maybe 100 years. I fear that moment, I have to tell you. <laughs> I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> but you know, if you're looking, for example, at your own career, this is the future of what we're going to be doing. Right? We're going to be doing stuff that machines can't do. We've got 10 years to figure this out. That will change our education, it will change the way we look at the world, and I think it's very important for us to refuse this idea of machine thinking. Right? We're just going to add some more information and get some more data, and then everything is solved, right? Everything is just math. Right? The CEO of IBM, Gini Rometti, routinely says that in the future decisions will be made, not by experts, not by anybody else, but by analytics and predictional models. I think that's partly true, obviously, when it's about easy decisions, you know, like, like air traffic control. But political decisions, business decisions, hiring or firing, would you have a human resource department run by a computer? 
that's what IBM would probably like, you know, <laughs> because they can sell you the computer. And I think it's not a bad idea, but in general, of course, I see the future as this, right, these two domes. I think the future is awesome humans on top of magic technology. You know, I love technology. I've been doing this for a long time, and I've been, I used to be in the tech business, in the music business, digital music in the 90s and, and around that time. Right? It's very important we keep this in mind. Right? The purpose of life is not technology. Right? It sometimes seems that way. So, awesome humans, how do you become an awesome human? Well, you don't become an awesome human by studying just technology. Right? Some people do, like Einstein. Right? But generally speaking, we have to study human things. Right? Philosophy, arts, understanding, creativity, imagination. That's what we have to teach our kids. That's really what their skills will be in the future. A programmer today, as you know, here in Romania, has a great job for the next, say, three, five, seven years, because then machines will do their own programming. You will speak to them and you will say, I need a new app that sells my houses. I mean, it's not, this is hard to do today, obviously, <laughs> but that's the future. So it's better for us to become awesome humans rather than experts on how to program apps. Einstein said once, computers are incredibly fast, accurate, and stupid. Human beings are incredibly slow, inaccurate, and brilliant. Together, they are powerful beyond imagination. Now, the key word here is together. <laughs> Humanity on top of technology. And that is what we have to strive for in terms of business, but also in terms of government. I mean, there's no way that we're going to go in the future and not embrace technology. Yeah, you can do that. You can move to Amish country or, you know, the mountains in Switzerland or, you know, go goat farming on Mallorca or something. Right? But, hey, you know, this exists. And this gives us huge benefits. I mean, technology will pr provide a solution for many, many things. Technology will not solve social or political or cultural problems, right? I mean, you know, we're not going to use technology to create equality. That's our job. So embrace technology, but don't become it. That's a key message also in my book. I want to thank you very much for listening, and I'm open for a dialogue on Twitter. Thanks very much. Our life is an algorithm. Our brain is an operating system. Keep it updated. I see fast. Upgrade to your best version. Powered by Orange. Innovation partner Glow. Driven by Nissan. Good mood partner Kaufland. In association with M Platform.